Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Galatians, chapter 3. We're going to look at verses 11 through 14 and then verses 23 through 29. And uh, last week we looked at Galatians 3 and we saw how the birth, the life, the death, and the resurrection of Christ fulfilled the promise of God to Abram or Abraham all the way back in Genesis 12 and Genesis 15. And it was a promise of the ful- a fulfillment of a promise that took two to 3,000 years uh, to come about, that through the seed of Abraham, all nations would be blessed. And we know that through the life, the death, uh, the resurrection uh, of Christ. And as we celebrate the coming of Jesus, the, the birth of Jesus, these passages help us to look forward to the second coming, that time when he returns uh, to fulfill uh, the, the kingdom in that second coming. Uh, today we're going to continue in Galatians 3, and we want to look uh, about at the purpose of the promise, or the purpose of his coming, the purpose of Christmas, if you would. And uh, his, his purpose in coming to earth uh, as a babe in Bethlehem. You know, our world is full of people who struggle trying to find purpose. They, they struggle trying to find meaning. Uh, they want to, they're, they're struggling some way to make themselves seem unique and uh, to, to find a purpose, uh, to create a unique identity. They, they, don't, need to be crea- they don't need to create. Uh, they'll scream about uh, identity and, and pronouns. They'll, they'll scream about this, this, uh, this aspect of themselves or maybe many celebrity or fame status, whatever. They're trying to, whatever they're seeking or whatever they're chasing, they're trying to create purpose and meaning in life. And uh, we, as believers, are, are growing in that sense of understanding that our purpose is God's purpose. Our purpose is God's purpose, that our purpose is about the kingdom of God, that we, we love because he first loved us. We live because he gave himself for us. And we want to be wrapped up and find our purpose not in what we can do or how we can be noticed or how we can be unique, but just how we can love others because Jesus loved us. You know, we also live in a world that has reduced the celebration of the birth of Christ. They've taken it from the observance of Christ Mass or a Mass that, that uh, uh, celebrated the birth of Christ to, uh, well, you know, it, it can be anything from... Uh, a spending free-for-all to a drunken brawl, you know? And, and we see that, uh, and it's, it's all about satisfying desires now. It's all about fun, family, tradition, and, and to some extent, family, fun, and tradition, that's fine. That's great. I have a lot of family fun and traditions that, I, that, uh, that you know, I, I hold on to. Uh, however, we have to make sure that we make no mistake the only Christmas gift of eternal importance and impact is God's gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. And we celebrate his coming because that's where our purpose is found. And, and that's who we want to be at. So as we look at that, that gift is the purpose of Christmas. Christ's coming is the purpose of Christmas. So let's take a look at God's purpose. And I want to see that in Galatians chapter 3, verses 11 through 14. We'll pick it up. This has been a recurring theme through the book. Uh, we're only halfway through the book, and you might already be sick of hearing this. Now it is clear that no one is justified before God by the law, because the righteous will live by faith. And so the law is not based on faith. Instead, the one who does these things will live by them. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us because it is written that everyone who's hung on a tree is cursed. And the purpose was that the blessing of Abraham would come to the Gentiles by Christ Jesus so we could receive the promised spirit through faith. And I want you to look what he says, the purpose. The purpose. The purpose was that the blessing of Abraham would come to the Gentiles, that the purpose of Abraham would come to men and women and boys and girls of all nations. 
So we spoke with a young couple that are going to invest a portion of their lives in a foreign country, trying to, uh, to reach people for Christ and train them up to start churches and, and see that multiply and impact that population with the gospel of Christ. We want to do the same thing here. We, we want to go out and, and be a part of that. We want to see people impacted by the gospel of Christ. And uh, all of the things that we do as a church, we want to see people impacted by the presence of Christ in their life. The purpose was the blessing of Abraham would come to the Gentiles by Christ Jesus. Now, there's two uh, quick things that we want to notice here. Go to the next one. First of all, two key points that are kind of our, our, uh, our jumping off point for this. First of all, no one is justified by the law. No one is justified by the law. You and I are incapable of keeping the law and being good enough and, and smart enough and sharp enough and spiritual enough to keep all of the law. Now listen, we struggle with the Big Ten, right? You know, now by the time that Jesus came, there were 613 rabbinical and Levitical laws. 613. I struggle to remember the Big Ten, Right? You know, we struggle with uh, simple things like, don't use the Lord's name in vain. Well, that's simple. Until you hit your hand with a hammer. You know, you get a flat tire on the way to church. You know, those kind of things. You, you know, that's, we struggle with that. Thou shalt not bear false witness. You, you're not, you, thou, you're not going to lust after your neighbor his wife or his servant or what he's got. Man, look at that truck he's driving. That is that's sharp. We get all caught up in it. We struggle with the Big Ten, let alone the 613. And by the way, I only know that number because I studied and looked it up and found the number. I have no idea what the other 603 are. All right? So we're not justified by the law. And as Paul will explain this, he tries to point out that Christ has redeemed us from the curse or the limitations of the law. The curse of the law and the limitation of the law is my ability. It's my ability. Now, you're, we're capable of great and wonderful things, aren't we? But we're also uh, capable of rotten and stinky things as well. And so my capabilities are the curse of the law. I am incapable of keeping 613 points of law perfectly uh, for 10 minutes, let alone one day, let alone a lifetime. And so we're not, uh, we're, the, we're freed uh, from, that, uh, from that limitation. Uh, and so no one's justified by the law because... Uh, the righteous will live by faith, and law is not based on faith. It's based upon performance. But Christ has redeemed us from the curse and limitations of law. He became the curse for us. He paid the price for that. And now we live under the blessing of faith being counted as righteousness, and that's made available to us. That faith being counted as righteousness. If you go back and you read earlier in Galatians, it, he talks about how uh, Abraham believed God, and it was counted as righteousness. We talked about that last week. Uh, James pointed that out. You can find that in Hebrews as well, that Abraham believed God, and it was counted for him, to him as righteousness. And you go back and again, I'll tell go back and read the Genesis narrative of Abram, of Abraham, and he was not perfect. But he believed God and was counted as righteousness. Now that's what we live under. We believe God. We believe in God. We believe the promises of God. We believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. And now we live under that blessing instead of the curse of having to be good enough to get to heaven. Paul explains this further as in verses 23 through 29 of Galatians chapter 3. He says, before this faith came, we were confined under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith was revealed. The law then was our guardian. 
So think about being under a guardianship. You, you, are, uh, you have to follow uh, what is laid before you. He says, it was our guardian until Christ, so we could be justified by faith. But since that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. We've been set free from that guardianship. We've been liberated from the law, and now we are the sons of God, the children of God, through faith in Jesus Christ. And so the transformation is we're no longer in that uh, probationary period, that guardianship, but now because of our faith, we are transformed to the, the children of God. Paul would write in Romans that we are heirs of Christ, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, that we will receive the inheritance of the redeemed, that we will be uh, noted at the end of time as the children of God, that we'll be welcomed into our Father's house uh, where we will rejoice with Him forevermore, where we'll be able to look at that last verse and uh, in uh, in Psalm 23 and talk about how he's prepared a place for us at his table and goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our life and we'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Man, this is some exciting stuff. We are set free from the limitations of the law and now, now we're the sons, the daughters of Christ, uh, sons and daughters of God through faith in Christ. Verse 27, for as many of you uh, as for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ like a garment. Christ like a garment. There is no Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then your Abraham's seed heirs according to the promise. Now See, what do you mean we put on Christ like a garment? Well, every day when, uh, when I go into work, I, mean, I get up and I get ready to go, I have two things that I have to have with me. I have a can of pepper spray, and it's not seasoning. And I have the ID that says, this is who I am, and I'm allowed to come into this facility. Now, I do not want to recount the number of times that I've had to make a 15 or 20 minute drive back into town because I got to the gate and there was no ID around my neck. It was a lot of time. It's still, and it will happen again, right? But for all intents and purposes, even though they see me, they know me, they can call me by name, that ID is my identity when I'm in that facility. Does that make sense? All right. And so now the idea is that we put on uh, Christ as a garment or as our identity as who we are. For instance, in this time, it was during the time of the Roman Empire. If a Roman centurion, a Roman soldier came through your, came through your area, you looked at him there was no questioning who he was and what he did. Correct? All right, listen, when you're driving down the highway and you uh, see a car parked on the side of the road and there's a man dressed in brown inside of that, suddenly you hope your cruise control is accurate. All right, you know, but there's there's no questioning who he is and what he does. The idea is that we want to be so clothed in Christ and so in tune with the Holy Spirit, and our identity wrapped up in our relationship with God, that there's no doubting who we are and what we're about. That's our goal. Now, there are days when, man, we shine. And there are days when we slink off in defeat. But the next day, we get up and we put on Christ as a garment. And we desire to live for Him. Now, if it was, if we have to live up to the law, well, we'd, we'd go crashing and burning on a regular basis. But because we're empowered by Christ and we want to be a representative of Christ, we want to live for Him, we're free from the limitations of the law. You see, the law imprisoned us as a guardianship demanding compliance. 
But as heirs of Christ, we're no longer under a guardianship. We're in a relationship with God as Heavenly Father, as Christ our Savior, our Lord. And now we are the children of God, uh, free from the law. Oh, happy condition. And faith frees us from the weight and the penalty of the law. He says, as you're baptized in Christ, you are clothed not in Christ, not just in Christ, but in Christ's righteousness. You see, uh, Isaiah was uh, famous for saying that our righteousness is as filthy rags. I'm not going to tell you what that really means, uh, but uh, it's a little bit dirtier, or I don't say dirtier, but it, it's a little bit more picturesque than what we normally say, all right? And, and so, uh, it, you know, our, our righteousness is as, as filthy rags, and so that's why when you receive Christ, you trust Him, you place your faith in Him, uh, then He pours His righteousness on you. When you stand before God, you'll not stand in your righteousness, you'll stand in the righteousness of Christ that covers your sin. And so we are made righteous in Him, we're baptized into Christ, clothed in Christ's righteousness, free from the law and free from the penalty of the law. And I love what it says here as he finishes this up. He goes, all who come by faith are heirs of God's promise to Abraham. Heir to God's promise to Abraham. There's no Jew, no Greek, no slave, no free. No male, nor female. You're all one in Christ. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed. Heirs according to the promise the purpose what's the purpose the purpose is that we could be covered and bathed in the righteousness of Christ and receive the blessings promised to Abraham some 2200 to 3200 years ago before Christ I say that would be I'm going to do them cover there you know 4100 to 5300 years ago so, the purpose of the birth, the purpose of the Son of God is to provide salvation so that all would receive the blessing of Israel. The purpose was that the blessing of Abraham would come to the Gentiles by Christ so that we could receive the promised Spirit through faith, the Holy Spirit of God. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is John 1.12. And I've got it up here in King James because that's how I memorized it as a teenager. Um, and I memorized it doing an Easter choir cantata. I memorized it as a song. As many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the children of God, even unto them that believed on his name. Uh, in the Holman Christian Standard, which, which I use here, uh, but to all who did receive him, he gave them the right to be children of God to those who believe in his name. The purpose of Christmas is so that you might have the, through faith, through belief, have the right to be called the children of God because you believe in the name of Jesus. So celebrate the coming of Christ. Celebrate the coming of Christ because it's a reminder that because he came, you're now a child of God. Because he came, you're no longer separated from your Creator. Because He came, you and I can have peace on earth with our God, with our Creator. Because we're clothed in the righteousness of Christ. The purpose of His coming, the purpose of Christmas, is so why we might be blessed by salvation in Christ and fulfill the promise given to Abraham.